Hi friends, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about everything to do with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, namely what it is, the treatments available, as well as the research evidence behind them. For those who don't know me, I'm Chris and I'm a dermatology trainee based in the UK. And on this video, I share my life experience and journey towards becoming a consultant dermatologist in the UK. I have been looking at some of your comments and emails lately, and some of you have suggested me to do a video on hyperpigmentation. Now, this is something that I haven't really thought of doing at the start, simply because there are so many videos out there in the market. But after doing my own thinking and doing background reading, I realized that um, doing this video is quite good because well, first of all, I'm interested in hyperpigmentation and doing this video will spur me into doing background reading and research. At the same time, there have been quite a lot of misinformation out there uh, on the internet and I hope that by doing this video, I can shed some light into this, um, especially the research science behind these ingredients. Now, I shall focus on the specific ingredients themselves rather than the brand names. This is because I feel that the ingredients are more important than individual brands as it is the ingredients that will cause the result that you want. Now just a disclaimer, I am by no means an expert in post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. In fact, I'm still learning dermatology every day and I'm not yet a consultant dermatologist. This is just me looking through clinical trials and papers to save you time and hopefully will make you better informed uh, in making decisions when buying products uh, to treat hyperpigmentation. So what is PIH? PIH stands for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and this is where you get darkening of the skin due to inflammation. Inflammation of the skin can be due to many things such as uh, most commonly seen in acne vulgaris but also in other inflammatory skin conditions like eczema. You may also get inflammation of the skin by using products such as chemical peels, physical scrubs and even certain exfoliants. PIH can happen at any age and affects both males and females equally. Now the risk of PIH is higher with darker skin types like myself. So using the Fitzpatrick skin type chart, you can see that patients who have skin types 3 or more are more likely to get PIH. So what happens in PIH? So in hyperpigmentation, you get accumulation of your skin pigment called melanin in the uh, layers of the skin. And it is subclassified into two main types. So you get the epidermal hyperpigmentation. And this is where your melanin accumulates in the superficial layers of the skin, also known as the epidermis. And then you get the dermal hyperpigmentation. And this is where the uh, melanin accumulates in the deeper layers of the skin in the dermis. The reason why they classify hyperpigmentation into two types is because some products that are targeted at the epidermal layer may not be enough to reach the deeper layers. So things like, for example, um, certain creams and even chemical peels. So what do they look like? So PIH basically appears as hyperpigmented patches on the skin, particularly on the face. And this is often with a prior history of trauma or skin inflammation. PIH is often a clinical diagnosis based on the history and clinical appearance. So we don't really need to do further investigations like a skin biopsy. We sometimes use a special lamp called a Woods lamp to help us differentiate between epidermal and dermal hyperpigmentation. So in epidermal hyperpigmentation, the lesion would look more pronounced and prominent with a well-defined edge and accentuated borders. However, in a dermal hyperpigmentation, the patches would appear more faded and less prominent. Now, there are many other skin conditions that can mimic hyperpigmentation and it is very important for us to be able to tell the difference because treatments may sometimes differ depending on what condition you may have. Melasma is a common skin condition affecting the face. Um, it typically affects the forehead, the cheeks and chin in a symmetrical distribution and can mimic post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. The other common skin condition is called post-inflammatory erythema and as the name suggests, it is erythematous meaning red rather than brown or black pigmentation. So how exactly do we treat PIH? There are so many products on the market and which one will be effective, which one aren't. 
So actually, to be honest, a lot of clinical trials are targeted at treatments for melasma rather than post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And the same products or ingredients used for melasma are then correlated with the, to treat PIH with the assumption that they will be effective as well. The main form of treatment is therefore sun protection. We know for a fact that sunlight, including UVA, UVB and even visible light, can cause hyperpigmentation to get worse. And so please use a good sunscreen at all times. So when I say good sunscreen, I mean a broad spectrum sunscreen protecting against UVA and UVB. So to protect against UVB, use a sunscreen with at least SPF 30 and above um, and apply it to your face and neck as well as any other sun exposed areas every single day. And if you're outdoors under direct sunlight, you may wish to reapply your sunscreen every two hours. UVA has a longer wavelength, so it can actually filter through uh, glass windows. So make sure that you apply your sunscreen even indoors as well. Other things that you can do to help protect yourself against sunlight would be to, well, first of all, limit your sunlight exposure or um, wear a broad brim hat, or sometimes you can even wear long sleeved shirts as well. Another very important thing that people miss out because they keep trying you know, new products to help with hyperpigmentation is to treat any underlying cause. Most commonly, hyperpigmentation um, is due to inflammatory skin conditions like acne and eczema. And by treating the underlying cause, uh, for example, acne, you have less risk of your skin getting PIH and scarring. So always try to treat the underlying cause. At the same time, make sure you avoid further irritation to the skin, so no picking, no rubbing or scratching the skin surface. Sometimes, not always, certain medications that you take may cause skin hyperpigmentation, and it's something to take note of, especially if you are taking quite a number of medications regularly. I have now put up a list of medications that commonly cause hyperpigmentation, and if you feel like one of them is may be causing hyperpigmentation, it is best to speak to your healthcare professional who may wish to switch this to something else to see if it works. The mainstay of treatment for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is topical hydroquinone. What it does is it helps to inhibit this enzyme called tyrosinase, which helps in the formation of melanin, the pigment in the skin. Now, hydroquinone is more effective in epidermal PIH rather than dermal PIH because the melanin in dermal PIH is deeper in the skin layers. Now, there isn't much data or research evidence behind hydroquinone in treating PIH. As I've mentioned previously, a lot of the studies were done on medications used for uh, melasma instead. If you're interested in the evidence uh, for all the key ingredients to treat PIH and melasma, I will link them in the description down below for you to have a read. But in essence, we know that hydroquinone is effective in treating melasma, and we think it may be effective in treating PIH as well. Hydroquinone can be prescribed as either a 2% or a 4% concentration, and we typically advise patients to apply to the affected areas up to twice daily. Now, if there are multiple areas of hyperpigmentation, you may wish to apply the hydroquinone to the entire face rather than specific hyperpigmented areas, as there is a risk of irregular pigmentation in the long run. From what I understand, topical hydroquinone cannot be bought over the counter in the UK and also in a lot of other countries as well. This is because of the risk of skin irritation and the risk of irregular skin pigmentation if used uh, for long periods of time, typically for over six months. And so it is important for you to get this prescribed by a trusted healthcare professional who can then monitor your skin to make sure that things are going in the right direction. Also, to make the skin more tolerable to treatment, we sometimes prescribe a combination cream called Triluma or Pigmenon. And these creams contain topical hydroquinone, a retinoid, as well as a topical steroid to calm the inflammation down. And actually, research has shown that this combination cream is effective and safe in treating hyperpigmentation. Another useful treatment is topical retinoids. This is an all-round treatment because it not only treats the hyperpigmentation, 
but it also treats underlying acne as well. This is commonly used and it works by increasing cell turnover and so facilitating melanin removal from the skin surface. However, the research evidence behind its use for PIH is still fairly limited. What you do is you apply the topical retinoid, which again comes in various forms and types, and the stronger ones being adapalene and tretinoin, to the entire face once at night. Now, it can irritate the skin and it's known to irritate the skin. So I think what we normally do is advise patients to use it sparingly, say once or twice a week, then subsequently up to once at night accordingly. There is simply just so much to talk about with regard to retinoid and I can just spend a whole day talking about it. So what I'm going to do is actually make another video just on retinoids if you're interested. In the UK, you can buy over-the-counter mild forms of retinoids and which you can definitely use and try out but the stronger ones like adapalene you will need to get it prescribed by a healthcare professional so the next one is azelaic acid and this is commonly used for both acne and rosacea what it does is similar to hydroquinone it inhibits the enzyme tyrosinase thereby stopping the formation of melanin, the pigment in your skin. It also has anti-inflammatory properties as well, so which is good for erythema or redness on the face. It comes in 15 to 20% strengths. And so what we typically do is to advise patients to use it uh, to the affected face twice daily for a few months. A clinical trial done showed that after 24 weeks of applying azelaic acid 20%, facial hyperpigmentation improved in darker skin type patients. And best of all, you can get this over the counter in the UK. Next up is koji acid. So koji acid is produced by various fungi species. And so it does um, help hyperpigmentation theoretically by inhibiting tyrosinase activity. It is available in concentrations from 1 to 4%. Unfortunately, there isn't much evidence behind this as the clinical trials don't just look at koji acid alone. For example, a 12-week study involving 80 multi-ethnic patients were treated with a combination of koji acid, amylica extract and glycolic acid. And they were compared to patients who were treated with 4% hydroquinone cream. They found that um, the people treated with a combination koji acid um, therapy had similar results to people um, treated with 4% hydroquinone. However, as you can see, the study is quite small and the researchers didn't just look at koji acid alone. And so I would say that the evidence behind this is pretty scanty and low. Um, however, koji acid, I think, to my knowledge, is pretty safe to use. So there's no harm in actually buying this uh, over the counter. And in fact, a lot of facial products have koji acid as part of its uh, ingredients as well. There are also other ingredients out on the market as well, and I've listed them here. And they include soya bean, licorice extract, arbutin, as well as ascorbic acid. Unfortunately, the evidence behind them is once again very poor, as there are not many studies that, that look specifically at these ingredients individually uh, for PIH. Fortunately for us, um, these products are generally safe to use and we can actually buy them over the counter in the UK. Another ingredient is niacinamide, which I've mentioned in my previous video. It's a form of vitamin B3 and can be used also for hyperpigmented skin. If you continue to suffer from facial hyperpigmentation, maybe it's best for you to find a reputable and respected doctor uh, to talk about this. They may wish to consider more invasive treatments like for example chemical pills uh, which have glycolic acid or salicylic acid. These are good for epidermal hyperpigmentation though there aren't many clinical trials on them for PIH. Another treatment options down the pipeline would be laser therapies and there are so many different types of laser treatments like picosecond lasers and IPLs. But make sure you find someone that you can trust that have the right qualifications because certain lasers can actually cause scarring and worsen pre-existing hyperpigmentation. Thank you for watching this video on post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. I hope you find it useful. I certainly enjoy uh, making these videos as it encourages me to uh, do background reading and research. If you are interested in videos like this, please drop me a comment down below and so that I know that this is what you want. Um, 
Thank you for watching once again. See you next time. Bye bye.